Hi everyone, I'm Yael Averbush West. I'm starting a podcast about American soccer culture, but before we dive into the season, we need to address what's happening in the world of women's soccer. In order to do that, I had a conversation with Meg Linehan, who broke the report for The Athletic. So if you follow women's soccer, you most certainly know the name Meg Linehan. Uh, most recently, especially, Meg has been somewhat of a real life hero in the women's game. And this is a fun conversation because our roles are reversed from what they typically have been because I am going to ask Meg some questions. And before we dive in, I want to know just a little bit about you, Meg, because you tell everyone else's stories. So I'm curious, um, why journalism? Why soccer? Like, let us know kind of who you are. Yeah, I mean, why journalism is a great question. I mean, I always like to joke that when I when I was in college, I studied medieval literature. I wrote my my undergrad thesis thing on Harry Potter, right? Like I have not I did not go to J school <laughs> and to not have because first of all, there were no the the job did not exist uh back when I was in school at all. And I was a kid that was really changed by the 1999 World Cup, right? Um So that was really my inflection point. I I was an intern for the Boston Breakers in the first year of WUSA. I was in the press box. Um, I remember going, running down to the locker room to get the lineups, the starting 11, (laughs) and running it back up and photocopying it. Uh, I actually wrote game updates, this was well before Twitter, in full HTML to publish to the Boston Breakers website. So really dating myself here as a a geriatric millennial in the world of women's soccer. But yeah, I mean, I think it, you know, I knew really early on, like, I'm not going to be a player, right? Um, And so when I really fell back into the world of women's soccer, it was right around the 2011 World Cup. And it was, how, how can I get into this world, right? And I started by taking photographs for Equalizer Soccer which is an independent soccer website run by Jeff Kasouf. And then from there, I just started writing. And then I started freelancing a little bit. And yeah, it's been like a a decade journey of my own, really, to end up as one of the few full-time women soccer writers in the country. There are three or four of us now. So, but for a while, it was was only one. Yeah. And I think it's it's cool to hear because I think, you know, young kids who love the game think there's two paths. You could be a player and then maybe if that doesn't work out, you could be a coach. So I always love to tell the stories of there's so many ways to be involved in the game and support the game uh, and build a career out of the game. And so um, very cool to hear you tell tell that story. And it, it, it does date you a little bit talking about the HTML, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> we, but I, I was around uh, playing then too. So I can't even say anything, <laughs> but so, so really what I want to talk about is, um, you know, if you haven't seen it, uh, a really important piece that Meg wrote came out on September 30th uh, titled, the Gu- This Guy Has a Pattern in the Athletic. And it, um, again, if you haven't read it, it, it's an absolute must read, but it's a very disturbing and eye-opening account of the abuse that specifically two NWSL players faced under uh, coach Paul Riley. And I want to kind of delve in a little bit to what went into that. Um, How long had you been working on the story? And are you able to share like what caused you to go down the path of initially talking to those players or kind of the the genesis of the article? Yeah, I mean, this was this was a story that was months in the work. So I mean, you know, late spring really was the first conversation that I had with the two of them. And I was I, I know Mana going back, Mana Shim going back to the 2013 NWSL season, I, I wrote a story about her right before the championship match that Portland Thorns FC won that first year of the league. So I think she was a, a person that I knew and we had kind of every time that she was in Boston or I happened to be in Portland, we would kind of, you know, like say hi to each other back when that was still allowed and <laughs> we could see each other's face to face. But um, yeah, I mean, this this has been months in the work and they they approach me because again you know we we see in the story as part of the reporting that they had not just gone through a reporting process in 2015 but they had also tried to go through a reporting process with the NWSL uh, in you know April March and April of this year and so when that was unsuccessful I think you know the, the two of them I think have shown incredible. I don't want to say patience is the wrong word, but I think persistence in ensuring that the story has come to light. And ultimately, it was through the avenue of reporting externally. But 
that was really the the path. And I knew from the first call that this was a story that was not going to be crucial in terms of what it would mean for the National Women's Soccer League, but it was a story that had to be reported to ensure that we chased down every single lead that we could show the kind of culture around the teams under Paul Riley. I talked to players from every single team that he coached since 2010. So it wasn't just necessarily their stories, though Monashim and Sinead Fairley are really the heart of this story, but it was also just showing that not only this is how the behavior is normalized and enabled, but also, again, and these are words that Sinead uses, but the kind of institutional betrayal around the story. Like, there's multiple parts. It, it is a very long story. There's a lot of information about it. And yes, it is kind of this harrowing story for the two of them. But I think it's really important, and I really wanted to to show how and why this takes so long to actually become public knowledge. Yeah. And I, I mean, you, you did a phenomenal job of it. I think it was, it was very eye-opening to so many people, not just the details of, of their story, but like you said, kind of the full picture of how this relates to some aspects of um, women's soccer culture, maybe even sports culture, which I want to ask you about in a second. But before we get there, I'm curious, um, well, two things. One, were you were you shocked as you talked to them and uncovered this yourself? No, I mean, that first phone call, I just remember, you know, I'm, I'm trying to take notes, right, of, okay, like, you know, I'm, mentally, my first thought is like, just complete shock, right, of knowing like, okay, I've, I've I've interacted with this person, right? I've I've also interacted with these two players before. Um, you know, I knew from the first call on kind of Alex Morgan's supporting role in a lot of this too. And just I just remember kind of thinking as I'm taking notes, just like the the line of, okay, I'm a reporter and then this is gonna be my job, but also, you know, I'm having my own emotional reaction, right? And I think it, it has been kind of interesting to see some of the reaction following the story because I think a few men have kind of been when I use the royal we when I'm talking about the NWL and people are like well is she reporting on it or is she in it and I'm just like I, I personally don't think those things can be divorced I've been covering the league or involved in the league I worked for the league since it started I, I don't pretend to not be a part of this world that doesn't mean that the reporting <laughs> is inaccurate right or that I'm not going to have some role and granted my role is different than other people's, but I'm still going to have a role in what happens next. And to not, to pretend like I'm not going to have an emotional reaction from this reporting or what has been happening across the league over the past week is just, to me, it's silly. Yeah. And I think that's a great point because we, we all create the culture surrounding what has happened in this league and what will happen. And it's not just the players. It's not just the team ownership, the coaches, the league front office, the media, the fans. It, it's, it's really, um, it's every single person who's involved, who's part of this culture. And I've even reflected personally of the part I've played in allowing this to be the culture in many ways. Before we kind of like delve into bigger picture, talking about like women's soccer culture and how these things play a part, curious if there are any details or anecdotes that didn't make the article that you feel like are, I'm sure there were many yeah. parts. I mean, there are many. I mean, the reason why they don't make the article is because we go through like extensive legal reviews. But I mean, it, it is like, I, there are other stories out there, right? That didn't, that didn't make it in. And I think they all kind of spoke again to that overall culture of what was normalized. And I mean, I even was thinking about my own experiences as I was talking to players of back when I covered the Boston Breakers during that 2015 season. I have my own memories of Paul Riley absolutely berating a player an entire game in Boston, just picking apart this one player the entire match, not saying anything else to anyone. And me looking at some other people and just being like, what is happening right now? Right? Like, is this normal? Like, am I the crazy one? Is is this normal? Right? So it's even, again, like, I think we're all having our own reflections of, did we say something? Did we not, like, did we feel like that got flagged appropriately? Because, I mean, I have my own other stories of when I worked for the league of flagging behavior that I thought was questionable and knowing how that, again, like, there has been this culture of silence. Like, it might, may or may not be dress addressed internally, but it certainly never makes it to the wider world. So... It definitely has been kind of this interesting, like, okay, <laughs> there's some stuff even, you know, I've seen with my own eyes that didn't even necessarily make the story and just being like, oh, yeah, like that, that is its own thing, right? 
Yeah. Yeah. And this is, I've, I've been thinking so much about, you know, the general power dynamic that exists. And I've felt this as a player is that um, especially in women's soccer right now, a, a coach's decisions, opinion on you, um, th- there's so much power that that person holds over the success of your your entire soccer journey. And even when, you know, when Sinead was talking about how um, Paul discouraged her from taking that spot to go to the World Cup, I actually... I was reading that and some things made sense to me. I was actually an alternate on that team. So I was waiting to see, you know, if that spot opened up and so many things started to click reading your writing on this. So, yeah, I'm curious if you've seen like other specific examples, like, can you name some other examples of ways that you've seen that power dynamic play out? You know, you talked just now about, you know, hearing Paul and and his communication to a player during a game, but are there other things in your work that have come out as kind of, um, examples of this power dynamic? Because I think sometimes it's hard for people to understand unless you really see the examples. I mean, I think we look at the current state even of of player security, right? Like the covering of the collective bargaining negotiation process that's happening right now. I mean, I think about, I have my own personal rule even as a reporter that I don't report on player trades within the NWCL until I know for a fact that the player knows. Because that's its own weird power dynamic, right? Where We're looking at players that are not necessarily, they're they're not making NBA money, right? Like someone like my coworker at The Athletic reporting NBA trades where a player is going and they haven't found out yet. Okay, they're making millions of dollars. I feel a little less ethically concerned about this, but, you know, there are trades that sometimes happen in the NWSL and the, the player on the other side of this doesn't know yet. And I refuse to kind of be a part of this process where players are getting moved from team to team and I think that that is also a real symbol of the power imbalance across the league that there is not a lot of power to the players in terms of you know free agency does not exist in this league so that's an element of it from the from the coaching perspective too it's it's even kind of you know you notice all of a sudden that players are starting to lose minutes like they fall out of favor mysteriously right And sometimes you will never get the true story on what has happened there. But I mean, generally, they can be completely unexplainable in terms of why a player suddenly is not starting anymore or it's not an injury, right? Like nothing is disclosed on the injury report. And that as well, like just having spoken to a lot of players over the years, those minutes are really important, right? Like getting those game minutes is very important to the development of a career, and that's another part of it, of, of the, the players can do everything that they can in training, but fundamentally there's one person making that decision of if they're playing or not. Yeah, and, and just to be clear, that doesn't always have to be an unhealthy power dynamic, but it is a, a serious mismatch in power. And I mean, it, it, it's extreme just as an athlete thinking about it, of the decisions a coach can make. You know, the national team coaches in the stands, do you, do you start? Are you pulled out of the game? Are you in a position that favors you that game? All of those things can, can you know, make sure you're included in a World Cup roster or not. And these, you know, these are things I've experienced myself. So it's just, I think that's a general sports um, issue, especially in sports where there's no, it's not like track and field with a timer, you know, it's based on right, yeah. opinion. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, you know, I think, I, I don't know if you've seen this, but I'm getting a lot of texts from outsiders in the soccer world who now see NWSL in the news, which kills me a little bit because I'm like, oh, there's such good coverage all the time. I wish people were tuning in more. But I think there's this unfortunate perception of like, oh no, the women's soccer world is crumbling. And I actually see this as a really important inflection point where there's a lot of hope for for real change because we're uncovering some serious um, systemic problems that I think we now can address. And we couldn't address them without understanding them better. And you obviously played a massive part in helping us to understand them. But I guess my question is for you is like, how, how do you think this change is made? Where do we go from here? Yeah, I think that is a really, really good point. I mean, even I, I spoke about this with a few other people, but you know, leading up to the story, right? Like, I cover this league. (laughs) Um, It's not like, okay, I'm going to be out of a job if suddenly the NWSL folds or anything. But there is this sense of like, are we destroying the league in order to fix this problem? And I I think what we have seen, especially over the past week, is that that is not the case. And also the players obviously don't want that to be the case, that there is this understanding that, and, and I think this is the concept that I've really, why I think I've been doing so much media so that way I can help kind of get this narrative across of the league as an institution is different than the league 
as the players, right? And the league doesn't exist without the players. And that's why the players leading in this particular moment is so important. And I think really is the path out of this moment is that we have seen incredible leadership already from the Players Association, not just in terms of kind of the immediate statement on Thursday, they were the first group to immediately figure out what what needed to happen, but also Wednesday's games in terms of both that moment of solidarity and then the resulting list of demands again. But that's also happened across other, you know, Portland players had their own list of demands for the Portland front office. So fundamentally, I do think the players are really the path out of what comes next. But also, I think that the general sense is that no one is looking for this league to fold, right? Or at least no one is looking for women's professional soccer, a professional league in this moment, to fail. The NWSL as a name, as a entity, is kind of secondary, right? Whatever needs to go needs to go, but what fundamentally is going to survive in this moment is the players and their power. And so that's why when, as we're going through this reporting and and what so many of the conversations with Mana and Sinead and, and others really revolved around is, we're doing this because the NWSL as a league right now, as an actual like institution, is not sustainable because it's actively harming the players. And that has to, we have to understand that in this particular moment, because until that is fully out in the light, it's just going to keep repeating itself. We're not actually solving any problems right at the moment, the way that we are discussing this prior to September 30th. Now that every, and I still don't think everything is out in the light, right? But I think having this kind of big ongoing discussion has certainly, maybe we don't, we don't know what that final path is going to look like, but there's at least an understanding that there is a path out of this moment right now. Yeah, well, that was extremely well said. You'd think you might <laughs> do this for a living or something. <laughs> um, no, but I think you said, you really cut to the core of, I think, what the real fear and conversation is. It's like that word fold has a really scary connotation because of the history of women's soccer in our country. And I will say, this is what I've been personally reflecting on. I'm curious if you've had the same thoughts, is I think of all the times that having been part of pre- previous league that no longer existed, we as players took an enormous amount of ownership when NWSL started on making sure the league survives. And I think that there were so many decisions that were made, ways we handled things that were all went back to, okay, this is an ideal, but we should look out for the league first and foremost. And I think we've finally hit the point where one, that's not necessary because the league can and will be successful, even with the players demanding everything they deserve, which is to be treated right and taken care of. And that that's not the way that things need to be done anymore, clearly. So I think, I think that's the real change is that no longer is it worth protecting the league at all costs. And right. the league wants that change as well. Um, so, so I think that's a really interesting point. I just think back on how many things I handled so lightly or didn't want to draw attention to because I was thinking of the health of the league. So you're right. Is everybody wants this to survive and right. especially the players. I mean, well, I I think, the players more than anyone. So yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, I, one of the moments that will always stick with me in this league is when Western New York played on that tiny baseball field, right? Which is such a weird blip, right? That no one really ever, like, that's not the thing that's going to be the downfall of the NWL. But Again, that is the stuff that earns coverage, right? It's not, oh, okay, here's this record-setting crowd in Portland or, you know, the North Carolina Courage or the most dominant team in women's soccer. That stuff, again, like there's an infrastructure problem on the media side as well. So that's why I think you get this kind of culture reinforced of we can't really highlight the facilities are inadequate, right? The sky blue stuff that happened early on in terms of, of Sam Kerr finally saying like, this is not good enough, right? Because that's what gets escalated up because the infrastructure within mainstream sports media, it's just not there for women's soccer, right? So there has been this fear of, okay, if I say something right now, it's going to just completely get blown out of proportion. And not only might it, it's going to affect me, but it could affect my teammates. It could affect the entire league. And that was an idea that was so crucial to include in the story because yes, like I think you and I have lived it on various sides of this, 
but for the general public to understand that this fear is a real thing. It is tangible in this league of wanting it to be better, but not wanting it to be better at the expense of the actual existence of the league. That's a tension that just you cannot divorce from how this story, like how it all happened. Yeah, and it's interesting you bring up that example because that was actually what really sparked me to work with some other active players to start the Players Association because rather than these things and players' opinions on that experience playing on the baseball field coming out on Twitter and and getting all this buzz, we thought, can we get the players, can we communicate this internally and solve these problems internally so it doesn't come out? And then obviously that contributes to a culture of like, let's just keep it you know, with the insiders, so it doesn't get into the media. And then obviously, so I I thought of all these moments over time, but I think the points you make are really great. Um, I have a couple last questions for you that are more more general, just talking about the culture of American soccer, because that is um, what this podcast is going to be mostly about, but obviously could not talk about the culture of soccer in this country without speaking to you and speaking about this specific, I think, really important moment in in the history of women's soccer. I think we're all going to look back one day and realize even more so than we already know how um, pivotal this this moment is. Um, But if you were just look in general, what to you is most American about American soccer (laughs) culture? That's a really good question. I don't know, because sometimes, you know, in general, in general times, like I would just be like, we are kind of the most ridiculous people online, I think, ever. Right. what I think has been really interesting to see even over the past week is that there is still so much anger and everything. But I think about like the the protest signs in Portland, and I'm just like, oh, yeah, there's this sense of humor, right? That like especially women soccer fans tend to have. So I, I think that has been kind of good to kind of see that coming back a little bit. But there is kind of like that sense of we can make fun of us, but no one else can make fun of us sort of thing going like, I mean... The joke that I think lives on best within the NWSL is this word "furt," which comes from this mistaken attempt at branding within the NWSL that is such an inside specific joke that just kind of keeps going and owners have kind of come around on it and everything like that. So there is this kind of real sense of like, this is something that fans and supporters have been such a huge part of the building of it. And I think that it's not necessarily a perfect space, right? Like I still think that women's soccer and American soccer, especially in general, needs to be better on a number of fronts, particularly like race is at the top of that list 100%. But there is this sense of we'll look out for each other no matter what. And I think that has also really come through in terms of seeing the supporters over the past week in terms of that, like we get to see it at it at the sport's worst moments and at its best moments. And I think that has been the the thing that has come through for me a lot, that there is this real sense of community behind this thing. and and again, not perfect, but something that I think is really a good, strong foundation that has been very, very good to see over the past week. Yeah, that's so incredibly well said and so hopeful, especially needed in this moment. So I think we'll leave it there for this conversation. But Meg, I can't thank you enough, not just for taking the time today, but for the the role that you have played, not just in this moment, but ongoing in elevating the voices of women's soccer players in, you know, propelling the sport forward. It it goes far beyond what I'm able to express, you know, in in a simple podcast. But really, thank you so much. And thank you for sharing your thoughts on it. And thank you for asking questions. Yeah, it was it was fun to have the role reversal. <laughs> yeah, we could do this more if you want. I'll just come up with questions for you and send them over. <laughs> Sounds good. Okay, thank you.